everybody. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. As always, you are the smartest, most charming, best looking people in Melbourne, Florida. And I don't just say that because you come to our talk. It's true. That's right. Oh, sorry. Um, very happy tonight to have Joe Dwyer, who's going to be talking about weird lightning. Um, now, we may hear some normal, the results of normal lightning. I guess there's something coming in. Uh, so it's either that or the spacecraft is landing on us, one of the two. Um, or both. Or it could be both. It could be both. Tiny squared happens sometimes. Uh, and so I think without further ado, Joe, tell us about Weird Lightning. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Hi, oh, well, welcome. Thank you for coming. Um, so I've been studying lightning now for, I think, almost 10 years. And first of all, it's very surprising how little we know about lightning. Scientists actually know very little about how lightning works. So so-called normal lightning, is, if there is such a thing, is very poorly understood. On top of that, there are a lot of very weird things that thunderstorms and lightning do. And I come across those in my research, and I usually don't deal with those because those are the tough things to understand. And I'm trying to just understand the easy stuff, the normal lightning. But that interesting, that weird stuff is fun, so I thought I'd put together a presentation and show you some of the things that are really uh, causing scientists to scratch their heads. Now, before I start, I want to acknowledge uh, some of the people that are involved in this research. I'm going to show you some research as well, and this is not a one-man show, and there are a lot of people here at Florida Tech and other universities that we work with that are actively involved, and I think several of the people up here are in the audience right now. Okay, let me start off, and this is the way I usually start my talks. I want to give you a few gee whiz facts about lightning, just to sort of give you some idea what we're talking about. So these are just a few facts. So lightning strikes the earth about four million times every day. Well, that's a lot. There's not always thunderstorms going on here, although it feels like it sometimes. Um, but there's almost, almost always thunderstorms going on somewhere around the world. Uh, we are the lightning capital of the United States. We get more strikes per year, per meter square, per kilometer square, per mile square than any other place in the country. There's a sort of a, a path that sort of follows uh, uh, four between uh, Orlando and Tampa where you get most of the, uh, the highest lightning concentration in the United States. Uh, but we're not the um, lightning capital of the world. There are places in South Central Africa that get more lightning, also a, a few places in South America that get more lightning. Okay, lightning costs the United States somewhere between four and five billion dollars in losses and damages. People get their houses burnt down, airport disruptions, uh, all kinds, you know, blackouts, things like that. And every year, lightning kills uh, roughly 100 people in the United States alone and injures many more. In fact, it's hard to know how many people are injured by lightning because it tends to be underreported. If you get shocked by lightning and it hurts and maybe you burn your finger, you're not going to necessarily run and try to find a scientist to report it. Okay, so lightning, oh yeah, and I almost forgot the point of this slide. Lightning actually kills more people on average than either hurricanes or tornadoes. So these guys get a lot of bad press, but year after year, these guys do more damage and kill more people, on average at least. Okay, now, there's a lot we don't know about lightning. Um, physicists love to answer how questions. Uh, how does lightning do this? How does it do that? And unfortunately, we're not so good about that. But what I can answer and what I can tell you about is what are some of the things lightning does? It's not as satisfying to answer uh, what questions uh, as how questions, but that's all we got right now. So we know that most lightning starts inside thunderstorms. So thunderstorms are kind of like big Van der Graaff generators. You end up getting updrafts that carry cloud particles up. You get precipitation, hail, and, and rain that falls down, and the particles rub past each other. That somehow transfers charge. You tend to blow the positive charge to the top with the updrafts. The precipitation carries down the negative charge. You separate the charges. Like charges uh, repel. Uh, opposite charges attract. The opposite charges don't like to be apart. They try to get back together, and lightning is one way that they do that, that they try to get back together. That's the discharge. 
We don't actually understand how lightning gets started inside the thunderstorm. The charges seem to be too small when we measure them. The field's too low. Nevertheless, we get lightning. Once it gets started, we don't understand exactly how it moves. It's a little bit of a mystery how lightning can form a hot channel through conduct, uh, a conductive channel through air. Air is a good insulator. Uh, how can you get this hot conductive channel that can go for miles through air carry electricity? That's still not very well understood. Um, you can see a uh, nice example here of lightning propagating through the air. The air is being broken down here. It's being converted from an insulator into a conductor at this point, carrying electrical current back to the source. Uh, th this channel you're seeing is probably about as wide as your finger. Uh, when lightning comes down to the ground, eventually it needs to decide what it's going to strike. It actually can't see on anything on the ground until it gets within, say, 100 yards of the ground. There's a layer of charge it sort of blankets the ground, so the lightning can't see the trees and the buildings until it gets quite close. When it gets close to the ground, then the fields start building up and you can get upward sparks that race up to meet the lightning, and then you get a short circuit. That's the, what's called the return stroke. Uh, if you've ever accidentally put your jumpers the wrong way across a car battery, you know what a short circuit is like. This is a short circuit across a 100 million volt battery. Okay. You came here for weird lightning. Exhibit A. This is what happens above the thunderstorms. Let's start there. So this is showing distance this way, 100, 100 kilometers here, 200 kilometers. If you don't like kilometers, what 100 kilometers was about 60 miles. Okay. Now we're going up this way in the atmosphere. So outer space is up here someplace. This is right at the edge of the atmosphere, the ionosphere. So about 60 miles up, and when you have a thunderstorm and you get a lightning discharge here in the thunderstorm, very weird things can happen up above the thunderstorm. This is called a sprite, sometimes called a red sprite. We also have these uh, other whimsically named objects. This is called an elf. It expands out at the speed of light. You have other strange things, blue jets and all kinds of things. There are other types of weird lightning called pixies that tend to dance along the top, and I'll even tell you about some other ones in a minute. Um, these things are really giant discharges. Sometimes they're called high-altitude lightning, and you can see they're miles across. So these are these giant jellyfish are humongous, and they're very high up, almost all the way up to the edge of space. And to give you some idea, when you observe these, when researchers study these, they typically look for them when they're, say, 500 miles away. So an ideal place to be studying this would be a storm over Georgia, and these would be over st storms up in Georgia, and you'd be looking up like that at them over Georgia. So these are very big and very high, and they last maybe a thousandth of a second. Now, these were only discovered around 1990. And so this, this is new. I mean, you know, the last 20 years is a very short time period, especially in science. And for a long time, airline pilots had been seeing these. They're, they last about a thousandth of a second, but they're very bright. And so you actually can see them. And they're quick. You know, it's like a flash bulb going off. Um, but they're, they're bright enough, and they're just slow enough so you can perceive them. And airline pilots, you know, flying along at night would see these things. Of course, if you're an airline pilot, you don't immediately say, hey, I saw something really weird tonight. All these lights, red, and they're really pretty. You know, you're not going to be an airline pilot very long if you uh, keep saying you see things like that. Uh, and so they, there was sort of anecdotal evidence of these for a while. And finally, a scientist took it seriously and pointed a video camera up above a thunderstorm and sure enough, started recording these things. And then they found that there are other weird things too, these giant expanding rings of light, uh, these donuts that expand at the speed of light, and other stuff too. So we're just starting to explore now the space above thunderstorms and finding that there are a lot of very weird things going on above the thunderstorms uh, as well as below. So let me talk just a little bit more about the sprites. If you zoom in, so this is a, picture, a real picture of a sprite. And you can see, so keep in mind, this is miles and miles across, and this is going all the way up to the edge of space, you know, maybe 30 miles high. Um, this is a type of discharge. These are what are called streamers propagating down. Um, so these are 
electrical discharge is kind of like lightning's electrical discharge. Remember I showed you the picture of lightning moving through the air and I said how it's breaking down the air in front? It looks sort of like that. This air is being broken down below this as it propagates. So it starts up here and moves down and then propagates up as well. I have, through the miracle of YouTube, a movie of this actually happening. This is a high speed let me see if we replay it here. So what you're seeing here, let me just say, this is a high-speed video of a sprite happening. You're looking in the space above the thunderstorm. This, is, this whole thing lasts about a thousandth of a second. That's pretty cool. Okay, now here's actually, um, um, my friends take these. So I, I've seen these before. It's nice to see them on, on YouTube. Uh, this is a close-up of one of these. So we're going to zoom in with the telescope and look at just a little piece of these streamers, these fingers propagating. You'll get some idea of the motion here, how complex these are. So you start to see things. There's a distant sprite. Now there's going to be one in the foreground. where You start to see all the streamers propagating downwards. Now look, now suddenly things start moving back up. We don't really understand that very well. Very complex events. Now, people were studying sprites and they started seeing other weird things going on. Now, you noticed before when I showed you the picture of the sprite, it started up high and then moved down. So it starts up near the top of the atmosphere and then propagates down, breaking the air down. Amateur photographers actually started catching these and now scientists are studying these. These are called a gigantic jet. And you notice it looks different. So the thunderstorm is down here. And it, just to give you a reference, the sprites would be maybe up like in this region here. This, again, is the top of the atmosphere, outer space. So this is an upward lightning that's starting from the thunderstorm and racing all the way up to the edge of space. And the current idea is this is very similar to normal lightning. So lightning starts inside the thunderstorm. And it can stay inside the thunderstorm. Or it can go down and hit the ground. It's called cloud to ground. Or it could go up and hit the ionosphere, which is also a conductive plane. So if it goes down, normal cloud to ground. If it goes up, this is what you get, a blue jet or a gigantic jet. And it expands out. The air is getting much more, um, much more tenuous as you go up. And so it, it's expanding out as it moves. But if you send a lightning up to the edge of space, apparently this is what it looks like, gigantic jet. OK, let's move on. <laughs> this is the so-called, I think everyone's heard this, the bolt from the blue. If there's anything here that should be scary, that's it. Now, imagine it's a beautiful day outside. You're going to go for a walk. You walk outside, the birds are singing, you take a deep breath, bam, you're dead. <laughs> what happened? Why is Bob dead on the ground? There's not a cloud in the sky. I didn't hear any thunder. What happened? Well, there was a thunderstorm some distance away. Maybe it's over the, beyond the trees over there. It looks like it's a long ways away. You can't quite see it. Too far away to hear thunder. And yet that thunderstorm, in actually a way we don't understand very well, made lightning inside. That lightning, instead of going down, instead of going up, went off the side. Wandered around a bit, finally decided to come down and hit Bob in the head. <laughs> Wrong place to be, Bob. <laughs> this is the so-called bolt from the blue. Why from the blue? Well, from the blue sky. It apparently came out of nowhere, out of blue sky. Um, but it really didn't come out of blue sky. It, it moved through blue sky from your point of view, but it really came from a thunderstorm just a long ways away. So there's a few lessons here. One, be careful. There might, even though it looks like it's a nice day out, there might be a thunderstorm over there that's still close enough to hurt you. So um, you need to pay attention to the weather. Now, this is a good place to sort of interject a few safety tips with lightning. So in my community service part of the talk. Okay, what do you do if you want to be safe from lightning? Okay, well, you can try not to stand right there. 
You can stay inside. In fact, that's really good advice, actually. Pay attention to the weather if there is lightning in the area. If you hear thunder, stay inside. Don't go outside. If you're outside and you hear thunder, go inside. Now, maybe you've heard the 30-30 rule. Who knows what the 30-30 rule is? Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, right, right, yeah. So if you, and a lot of people get this backwards. Do I, do I hear the thunder, then wait for the flash, or do I see the flash and wait for the thunder? Now, of course, the thunder comes after the flash. The lightning heats up the air to about five times the surface temperature of the sun. The air expands, and that makes the thunder we hear. So the lightning makes the thunder. Light travels at the speed of light. That's really fast. Sound is maybe about a thousand feet a second, so it takes a while to get a few, go a few miles. And so there's always a delay from when you see the flash to when you hear the thunder. And the old advice was, okay, if you want to know if it's safe or not, you see the flash and then you count. One, one thousand, two, one thousand, three, one thousand. And if you hear the thunder before you get to 30, okay, you're in trouble, go inside. Now this is like the dumbest rule in the world. <laughs> it's like coming up with a rule, you're, you're standing there and suddenly you see a herd of stampeding elephants coming at you. We have a rule to tell you if you should run or not. You count the number of elephants, divide by the number of tusks, and no, you run. If you hear thunder, go inside. Don't stand outside and count for 30 seconds. That gives lightning 30 seconds to get you. Okay, but seriously. Thunder only travels, you know, 10 miles or so. Then you can't hear it anymore. If the thunderstorm is within 10 miles, that's close enough to get you, see? So it just, I mean, okay, you, you know, there are nuances here, okay? Maybe your chances are slightly, you know, it may be slight, you know maybe you want a, a, a one in a thousand chance instead of a one hundred and eight hundred chance or something. And so if you timed it and all that, you might be able to get the probabilities just where you want them. But really, I mean, don't mess with it. Just go inside if you hear thunder. Okay. The last part of the 30-30 rule is after you hear the last thunder, after the thunderstorm's over, after the sun comes out and the birds are singing again, wait 30 minutes. Sometimes the thunderstorm, as it's dissipating, the charge centers will start separating, cheering off, and you'll expose the positive charge, and it will send down one big lightning at the end. And that's the one that often kills people. So this can happen up to 30 minutes after it looks like the thunderstorm is dissipating, after it looks like it's over. It can still send out lightning. So wait 30 minutes before going outside. Okay, now, what if you're outside, you're out hiking or something, and you can't get inside. Or you can go in a, a car is a good place. Inside a house, inside a car, those are good places. What if you can't? You're outside. There is a so-called lightning safety position. Okay? So here's the lightning safety position. So you put your feet together, stand on your toes, you squat down as low as you can, and you cover your ears. You make yourself into a little ball. Cover your ears because you don't want your eardrums burst from the thunder. Now, why do you do this? Why not just lie on the ground? Well, if lightning struck the ground, the currents will flow along the ground, and then they'll th flow through you. That'll kill you. Notice my feet are together. Why? Well, it hurts to have current go up one leg and down the other. <laughs> it goes through things I care about. <laughs> OK, so keep your feet together. I'm not sure I wanted to hear that. Okay, so you want to make yourself in a little ball. You don't want to be the tallest, pointiest thing around, okay? You don't want to be taller than that tree, which, by the way, you don't want to stand next to because if lightning strikes that tree, it's going to send out sparks everywhere that can hit you. And there's, I have a video here of lightning. It looks like it's hitting a tree, and you'll see what I'm talking about in a minute. Okay, so if, um, if um, you see a thunderstorm, uh, best to go inside. If it's near that's producing a lot of lightning, you can hear the lightning. Now, you might ask, that's coming out here, why don't I just duck? Okay, ducking sounds like a good idea. I mean, after all, you don't want to be sta staying in the lightning safety position for a very long time. What you doing there, Bob? Well, I'm in the lightning safety position. <laughs> Maybe you should join me a minute later. 
Frank, Bob, what are you doing down there? We're in the lightning safety position. I mean, it's like a, a scene in a sitcom or something. <laughs> How long can you possibly stay there in the middle of the sidewalk in the lightning safety position? You know, your friends are going to laugh at you and think you're nuts. When you do the lightning safety position is when you feel like you're about to be struck. Your hair starts standing up. I don't know what that feels like anymore. <laughs> um, if you feel, you start hearing crackling discharges, you can tell something's about to happen. That's when you get down quick. Otherwise, you spend the time to get inside. Okay. So, what about ducking? Maybe you just wait till you see it coming, then you assume the lightning safety position. Sounds very efficient that way. The problem is that lightning going from there to there went roughly one million miles an hour. So it went from there to there in about one one hundredth of a second. Now, I'm getting old and as fast as I used to be. I don't think I can duck, even if I saw it, in one one hundredth of a second. I mean, that's why they make the lights yellow for so long, right? So you have time to react. Now, one one hundredth of a second. That is like ducking in the time it takes sound to go from me to you. Okay, we're gonna do an experiment here. I'm gonna say duck, and you try to duck before you actually hear the word duck. <laughs> okay, we're gonna try it, ready? Duck. No. Of course, it's not quite fair, you knew I was gonna say it, right? I, I gotta spring it at you at some point. Now, if that wasn't scary enough, we also have these so-called bolts, super bolts, big bad lightning. These are really big lightning. So, yeah, here we go. Okay, I need to explain this. Um, my wife here bet me I would not say that. Major wow factor. <laughs> I won. Okay. Supervolts, 100 times brighter optically than normal lightning. So lightning is pretty bright. If you've ever seen close lightning, it is really bright. It's probably the brightest thing you will ever see. 100 times brighter than normal lightning. Now just to put this in perspective, so-called normal lightning has 30,000 amps of current flowing across 100 million volts. And this is going to be 100 times more powerful than that. Good news is about one in a million flashes are superbolts, so, so they're rare. What's interesting, actually, is spacecraft have seen lightning on other planets. They've seen lightning, for example, on Jupiter. Jupiter seems to produce normally superbolts, kind of like we see here on Earth, except that's what's common on Jupiter. So apparently big planet equals big lightning as well. Let's move on. Weird lightning. Sympathetic lightning. Now, sympathetic lightning was first seen from outer space. Astronauts would, when they're flying in space, would look down and you can see lightning. Here's a picture of lightning on the Earth. And you can see it going off here, 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 and here. And what they noticed is when it would go off here, then it would go off here, then go off here, and go off here. It'd be like a chain of lightning, like it was communicating sympathetically. This is weird. I mean, the distances are huge. And so it's, a hard, it's very hard to understand how this could happen. Now, I've got a video here that kind of shows it. It's, it's hard to tell if, from this video if it's real or not, but people have done statistical studies and shown that this is actually real, that you will get these lightning chains. Okay. All right, so this is a scene from the space shuttle, and you can see all these lightning flashes going off. And you stare at it long enough, you can see that there's, there appears to be some relationship. It's just like a, a whole chain goes off. And the distances are large here. Now, it's, you've got to be careful with things like this. You start, your, your brain likes to make patterns. But there is, you, you look at this, you can see there are relationships between the flashes. This is so-called sympathetic lightning. Now, why is this so weird? There's no obvious way that this should work. 
you can calculate, okay, I mean, these, some of these storms could be 50, 100 miles apart. If you calculate what's this doing here to this, the electric field changes are too small to make any difference. There's no way the lightning could propagate from here to here. There's no obvious mechanism to make this work. Now, this is interesting because we don't understand very well how lightning initiates in the first place. Just normal lightning, how does it get started? So this is a clue, actually. If you can understand sympathetic lightning, it may give you a clue to how normal lightning gets started. So it's important. Let's move on. Volcanic lightning. If, if, light, if the volcano doesn't get you, the lightning will. This is a real picture, at least as near as I can tell, according to the Daily Mail. Of, so what have you got here? So this is a volcano and this is the plume here, and this is all lightning that's going on. There's a couple sources of the charge here. The, the volcano itself, can, the charges can be transported up into the plume, but also there's a lot of moisture along with the ash. And so these volcanic plumes or ash clouds are really kind of like dirty thunderstorms. And a lot of the same physics goes on, or the same meteorology. These start to rise up, you start forming ice and precipitation and updrafts and the whole thing works in a similar way. Just very spectacular here. So there are some similarities to thunderstorms, but there's some differences and it, it clearly looks different. So we're still trying to understand volcanic lightning. It certainly looks weird to me. Okay, spider lightning. Certainly sounds creepy, spider lightning. Here's a nice picture of spider lightning. I'm sure everybody's seen spider lightning. The nice thing about giving a talk here in Florida, everyone goes, oh yeah, I know that. <laughs> That's when you see, you look up and you see the lightning just sort of racing along the bottom of the thunderstorm, maybe going from one part of the sky to the other. And I actually have another movie here of spider lightning. I love YouTube. There you go. Isn't that cool? Okay, now what's happening is lightning, okay, lightning travels very fast, but sometimes as it's moving along below the cloud, it slows down just enough when it's going across, say, you know, five or 10 miles across the sky. It's just slow enough so you can perceive the motion of it propagating across the sky. And so that's spider lightning. It's actually just normal lightning. It's just going in such a way that you can see it and it looks very pretty. Now, there's actually, I wanna show you uh, this one here because it sort of brings home what we're talking about here. And th this also illustrates why you want to know the lightning safety position. Now you can see lightning strike in the distance and watch the cloud that forms when it hits this tree. It must just blow it to smithereens. You can see, look at that right there. You can actually see, did you see the beating? That's so as the, as the return stroke cools down, it beads, it, you see these little separate bright beads. We actually don't understand that very well, why it does that. Okay, let's, let's move on to more weird lightning. So-called SIDS, compact intracloud discharges. This is actually my favorite one. To me, this is the most bizarre. So these are also called narrow bipolar events. These are the most powerful natural radio emitters on Earth and in the space around the Earth. So you'll have a thunderstorm and suddenly, with apparently nothing else going on, it'll go boom, you'll get this very powerful burst of radio waves. And the whole thing lasts maybe 10 millionths of a second. So absolutely nothing before, no lightning before, no leaders, no breakdown, no discharge, nothing, it's quiet. Boom, most powerful radio emission on the planet, and then nothing after. It doesn't emit any light. 
This is more powerful than normal lightning and emits no light inside the thunderstorm. Just these big bursts of radio waves. We have no idea, absolutely no idea what's making these. Okay. Very weird. Okay, here's a fun one. Ball lightning. I'm not sure this is actually supposed to be ball lightning, but it looks like a ball and I need to show something. So I, I chose an appropriate font to go with this picture. So what's ball lightning? All right, so imagine you're sitting down watching TV. Maybe there's a thunderstorm outside. Okay, and so you look up and out your window you see a ball of light. A picture maybe as bright as a 60 watt light bulb, about the same size, just like someone was standing outside holding a 60 watt light bulb. Except it's just a ball that's glowing there. And then it enters through the glass in your window into your living room. Moves around, seems to zero in on you, <laughs> comes up to you and then goes boom! <laughs> and disappears. Ball lightning. This has been reported for hundreds of years. Almost every time I give a talk, there's usually at least one person in the audience that's seen it. And it's not the crazy person either. It's the doctor with the well-established practice. Or, you know, these are, you know, normal people see this. It's not uncommon. Nobody understands what makes ball lightning. It's a real mystery. And there's a few G sort of facts here. And you can read them, but basically I described it. It's a bright glowing ball, usually about the size of an orange, slowly moves horizontally across the ground. It's been seen inside aircraft. It's been seen to enter through the cockpit window of an aircraft, bounce down the aisle, exit out the side window, and roll out along the wing, seen by the whole crew. Now, if that ain't weird, I don't know what is. There are theories of ball lightning. In fact, every branch of science has its own theory of ball lightning. Here's a few that I list, and I even included the reference if you want to look it up. It can be some kind of electrical phenomenon, though I don't know what electrical phenomena would go through a cockpit window. High energy plasma, sounds good. This guy, I get emails from this guy all the time. He has a new theory about once a year. He has a theory that it's this high energy these high energy electrons oscillating, producing gamma rays. So actually, if this theory is right, if you see it, stay away from it because you would get a lethal dose of gamma rays from ball lightning. Um, some kind of a chemical reaction going on. I, I don't know. Um, there are, I guess, what I would <laughs> personally, I would not take mini black holes seriously. It's like, oh yeah, that explains everything. <laughs> Many black holes. I could come up with a theory that explains everything too. <laughs> okay, let's move on. Terrestrial gamma ray flashes. So you're starting to get the idea. I mean, it does some weird things. I'm not talking about gamma rays coming out. And this is a, this is a. Uh, image from a um, YouTube press release that NASA did. So they had the, all the press people at NASA put this together. And we had discovered these electron and positron beams shooting out and whacking spacecraft thousands of miles away. And we actually discovered these here at Florida Tech. And we did this big NASA press release. And this Right here, these are showing the gamma rays. Thunderstorms make these big bursts of gamma rays called terrestrial gamma ray flashes. They're so bright they can blind spacecraft hundreds of miles away. Really intense uh, bursts of gamma rays. We don't understand how they do it, but there they are. And they can make these beams of electron positrons. And this is a computer simulation that we use, a scientific computer simulation that simulates the gamma rays moving up and out of the atmosphere. And so I, the NASA press people approached me and asked me, could I make the gamma rays so they could do this nice image? And I said, sure. So I ran my simulation and I was having some fun with it and I made it look really cool. I gave them like this deep red. It looked like this burning explosion coming out, like these flames shooting out. It looked really, really cool. And I sent it to them. They said, no, gamma rays are pink. 
That's our official gamma ray color at NASA is pink. <laughs> so there you are, pink gamma rays. It would have looked much weirder if it was red, trust me. Okay, so here's the next frame. And as I said, these, it, you, sent, you knock high energy electrons and positrons out of the atmosphere. Positrons are a form of antimatter. Very weird. Thunderstorms, seriously, thunderstorms make a form of antimatter. The anti electron positrons. It's something they do, it's part of their normal process. And it actually controls how the thunderstorms electrify the production of positrons. It's bizarre. It's like something out of Star Trek. But it's something that thunderstorms do. It's very weird. And we're doing a lot of research here at Florida Tech to try to understand this. Now these terrestrial gamma ray flashes are actually dangerous. They could be dangerous. There was a lot of gamma rays coming up. Remember, they blind spacecraft after these gamma rays go up through all that atmosphere into outer space and go all the way out there where the spacecraft are orbiting. They're so bright, they can blind these, these gamma ray instruments that are designed to look at bright astrophysical gamma ray bursts. Now imagine you're inside the thunderstorm where it was made in an aircraft that probably shouldn't have been there in the first place. What kind of dose would you get? So we can calculate this. It's a kind of a complicated plot. The, there's basically three lines you need to look at. This is the biggest dose at this level that you want to have in a year. This is the so-called regulatory limit. If you work at a nuclear power plant or something, you never want to get doses higher than this. And when they're talking about these accidents in Japan, you know, they're worried about people are getting doses. They're worried about people exceeding this level of radiation dose here. This level here, and this is in sieverts, by the way, it's just a unit that we measure radiation. This level here is where you would start feeling, feeling physically ill from the radiation dose, from the gamma rays and the high energy electrons and positrons. The terrestrial gamma ray flash, the dose is somewhere between those. So this is, you're in an aircraft that accidentally went through a thunderstorm and you're doubly unlucky, one of these terrestrial gamma ray flashes went off. This is the dose you would receive inside the aircraft, somewhere between biggest dose you want in a year and the dose that would make you physically ill. Our best guess is it's the dose is probably somewhere in here, which is basically you would receive your entire lifetime's worth of radiation, the biggest radiation you'd want to get in a lifetime, in about one one-thousandth of a second. That's a terrestrial gamma ray flash. Now you might say, Dr. Dwyer, that's scary. Should I fly? Basically, don't worry about it. It's, the chances of this happening are sm small, certainly small. And this is not the first thing I worry about when I get on a plane. Um, <laughs> now, you, you, might, you might ask, well, maybe we should tell somebody about this. Pilots already know that you don't fly into a thunderstorm. Okay, now there's probably 10 ways a thunderstorm could get you inside an airplane and inside the thunderstorm. So, okay, now we got 11 ways. So, you know, pilots already try to avoid going into thunderstorms. They are big, violent, dangerous places. Uh, so this is another way that you can get hurt. These tend to go off maybe once per thunderstorm. And thunderstorms are big. The chances of being the wrong place at the wrong time are small. So I, I still fly, I still take my kids on airplanes. Um, there are other things to worry about. Okay, now I want to tell you just a little bit about some of the research that we're actually doing here. So we're trying to understand all this. We're trying to understand terrestrial gamma ray flashes. We're trying to quantify the risk. One way that we're studying all this is with rocket-triggered lightning. So the problem with, the reason that we don't understand lightning very well is it's very difficult to study. You never know when lightning is going to strike. You don't know where to point your camera, your instruments. You point them here and it strikes over there. So rocket trigger lightning is a way of sort of artificially forcing the lightning to strike a given place. You put all your instruments around this tower and you launch a rocket and that brings the lightning down to you. It's real lightning. In many ways, just like normal natural lightning, you're just giving it a place to strike. You're sort of forcing it to strike here. And then we can set up our instruments. And by the way, that's not ball lightning. That's probably just a water droplet on the glass. 
I've got some movies here of rocket triggered lightning. This is at a facility that we run with the University of Florida up at Camp Blanding, and this is making lightning. There's the rocket. There's the lightning. Okay, I'm going to show you it in slow motion now. There. Those, each bright flash is the stroke where you get the big current. So let me show you one more. Here's the rocket. Three, two, one, fire. Okay, one more, slow motion. So this is actually fun stuff. I think a lot of people go into physics because they like to blow things up. And this sort of satisfies that basic need. So actually, um, yeah, Ernie here recognizes these pictures. Remember those? Yeah, he built these. Um, so these are our x-ray detectors. And we have, here's the launch tower. The rockets are in those tubes ready to launch. So the lightning is going to be up here. And we're going to measure and see what the x-rays are doing here. So it's now an experimental science. We can repeat the experiment. We can measure something, look at the results, and say, oh, that's weird. Let's do it again. Launch another rocket and make more lightning. So we've made a lot of progress the last few years. So what do we find? We found that lightning emits, emits x-rays. This is brand new. We just figured this out. Right, it's been eight years ago. So before 2001, nobody knew that lightning emitted x-rays. You would ask a, a lightning physicist and ask, does lightning emit x-rays? They'd say, no, nah, that's crazy. Lightning doesn't emit x-rays. Now we know that it, not only does it emit x-rays, it emits it every time, and they're really, really bright. It actually has something to do with how lightning moves. Remember, we were having trouble understanding how lightning propagates. Apparently, the x-ray emission is playing some role in it. And so now that we've got this new piece, we're making progress. This leads me to x-rays. That's another weird thing that lightning does. This is a picture from a Scientific American article that I wrote a few years ago after we discovered that lightning emitted x-rays. So they wanted to do an article on how do you show this. Well, if you're in Tampa playing golf, it's going to happen. The energies are actually about right. The energies you would, that come out of lightning, the x-ray energies are actually about the same that you would get with a chest x-ray or a CAT scan. We uh, are curious what all the x-rays look like coming out of the lightning. So I, my students and I built the world's first x-ray camera for studying lightning. That's it right there. We tried to come up with a better name, but we finally just settled on X-CAM. It's, it's hard working with X. You know, it's just not too many words you can form with it. So here's the world's first image of lightning in X-rays. OK, it only has 30 pixels, so it's not the, the sharpest image in the world. But we're just getting started. Come on, it's the first one, right? The good thing about this camera, OK, what it lacks for in pixel number makes up for in speed. It can take 10 million frames a second for two full seconds. Okay, So it is fast. You might even say lightning fast. You need to be fast to study lightning. So guess what? That is a millionth of a second apart. So you can see the lightning propagating down. Here's the tower. So as it's coming down, there's where the x-rays are. There's where the tip of the lightning is. A millionth of a second later, now it hits the tower. You can actually see it coming down. In fact. It takes 10 million frames a second. Let's put it together and make a movie. It's fuzzy, but you can still see the basic idea. Now, this whole movie, I'll, I'll loop it, but the whole movie is going to last 2.5 microseconds, 2.5 millionths of a second. So nobody blink, OK? It's going to be fast. So here comes the lightning coming down. And you can see the bright x-ray propagating down with the tip of the lightning. So the x-rays are coming from the tip of the lightning. That's new. Nobody knew that before. So we're starting to understand a little bit how x-rays come from lightning and how lightning propagates. So this is just brand new research. We're the only ones in the world doing this right now. OK, so let me wrap it up. So I'm back to my original font here. 
Uh, lightning uh, is not well understood by scientists. It's really full of mysteries. It's actually a great topic for scientists. All the questions are simple ones. How does it get started? How does it move? You know, questions my, my kids can understand. Um, the x-rays that we discovered recently are perhaps a new piece that will help us sort of put it all together. They also give us a new way, as I showed you, of looking at lightning. In science, whenever you have a new way, a new tool of looking at something, the microscope, the telescope, you make big discoveries. And this is also tr turning out to be the case for lightning as well. Now finally, I showed you a lot of weird things that somewhat seemed random. This weird thing, and that weird thing, and this weird thing. What is really weird is many of these seem to be linked together. When you get one of them, one of these weird things pops up, often you see another one popping up at the same time. When these terrestrial gamma ray flashes, these bursts of gamma rays and antimatter are made, more often than not, these compact intracloud discharges, these weird big bursts of radio waves are in there somewhere. They're somehow connected. These giant jets shooting up, these blue jets shooting up to the ionosphere, they start popping their heads up. All the weird stuff tends to happen together. We don't understand that. We don't know why that's happening, but it's a, it's a clue, something that's telling us something. And so lightning research is really, it's a lot of fun. You get to blow things up, you get to study things that are big and bright and also very strange. So thank you very much. Thank you.